Uh, welcome, everyone. I am doing this video at the request of a patient who asked me the other day, um, you know, um, is there a good source for patients to go and look at the genetic markers of myeloma and, and, and what they mean for the disease? So I'm going to try to make a very short uh, video trying to explain what we mean when we say genetic markers and uh, how do we use that information in the clinic for patient care. Um, let me start by just providing some, some general background. When we talk about the genetics of myeloma, we talk mostly about those changes that occur in the myeloma cells and the plasma cells. The cells of the rest of the body are normal. So these are very, very specific changes that occur in the, in the plasma cells or the myeloma cells. And uh, we do think those are the changes that give rise to the myeloma itself. And I'll explain in a second how that, how that happens. Uh, so, so we're not talking about changes in the rest of the body. The reason I, I explain this, and it's so important, is that whenever one thinks about genetics, the first things, thing that comes to mind is, is this something that will have a hereditary component. What about my, my family members? So we're not talking about the kind of genetics that you pass on from generation to generation. These are just the very specific genetic changes that occur in the cancer cells, in the myeloma cells. So that's what we're going we're gonna to be talking about. Now, we know that, that um, uh, myeloma, like it's true for most other cancers, is primarily a genetic disorder, meaning that there are some genetic changes that occur in a subtype of cells that make them become cancers. And that's, that's the fundamental basis of myeloma. And um, a natural question that one could ask is, is, is there anything I did or I didn't do that made me have those genetic changes? And the answer is no. From what we know, it appears that most of these changes are just simply accidents in nature, uh, meaning there's nothing you did like um, you know smoking or other major factors that would have made you more likely to get some of these genetic changes. They're just again um, uh, errors that, are, that occur during the normal development of, of um, the cells that ultimately become the myeloma cells. I um, often will describe this as like typos. And, um, you know, there's in, in our body, as the cells divide, uh, they can uh, sometimes uh, go through a process where as they're uh, duplicating their DNA, they introduce a little mistake, a typo. Uh, now, most of the time, as you know, if you, if you find a typo in the text, it really makes no sense. So, you know, those cells really have no consequence. But every now and then, there can be a tiny little typo that changes the whole story, changes a sentence or changes a, a whole paragraph or a chapter. And if you have one of those typos, uh, which happens in one of the cells that become the myeloma cells, that's when they become um, uh, cancer cells. So, so it's rare. Uh, we all can get some of those genetic changes, but uh, it's only a few of them that lead to the, to the myeloma. So that's an important point, number one. There are some families where there's, there's uh, family members that are affected with myeloma, but they really are the exception. For most people, myeloma is not considered a hereditary disease. So we call it in medicine sporadic, meaning you have the same chance as the next person. Uh, so that's a very, very important point. Now, when we say myeloma, obviously we'll say multiple, but I've used the term multiple and many myelomas before to say that not all myelomas are the same. And through the work of many, many groups, we have learned that there are subtypes of myeloma. And I would like to explain to you the subtypes uh, next. There are two big groups of myeloma um, uh, types, and then one of them is broken to, into many subgroups. There's the myeloma type that we call the hyperdeployed myeloma. And what it means is that uh, there are some myeloma situations where um, uh, the myeloma cells, as they were normal, at some point during the cell division, in one of the, the divisions, something goes wrong, and they keep an extra copy of a chromosome. Um, all of our cells have uh, the same number of chromosomes. They have 23 pairs. If you're a male, you have uh, 22 chromosomes uh, that are the autosomal plus and your, your sex chromosome. So you would be, you know, um, uh, 46XY if you're a male, 46XX if you're a female. Well, in hyperdiploidy, myelomas retain extra copies of a certain number of chromosomes. Interestingly, it's mostly the odd number chromosomes. So instead of just having 46, most of those patients have close to 53 chromosomes. So if we had a way to 
to go and measure this in every cell, and we have some of those ways, uh, we will find that they have gained extra copies of chromosomes. This is a myeloma subtype that is um, seen more commonly in the elderly, and the, 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 the associations are not absolute, but you would see it mostly in older individuals, slightly more common in males, with more mature uh, differentiated myeloma uh, of the IgG kappa type. And again, this is not absolute. You, you have to do the genetic test what you have. Um, what I mean by mature and differentiated, that means that uh, the cells resemble more like normal cells. And one of the things that happens in myeloma and in other cancers is when the cell resembles more its nor normal counterpart, they tend to be more responsive to treatment. They tend to be associated with better prognosis. And that's what we find with, with hyperdiploidy. Uh, for instance, these patients can respond very, very well to treatments uh, such as uh, with the drugs we call imids. That includes uh, lenalidomide and pomalidomide. And as I mentioned, it's particularly common in the elderly. There's uh, some studies, um, including one from Dr. Ross in the UK, that looked at the prevalence of this, and up to 70% of patients who are in the 70s and 80s will have this form of myeloma. If you take all myelomas normally, it's only about half of the cases, okay? So that is the hyper-deployed myeloma associated generally with a better prognosis, more indolent. Sometimes I think of it like hibernating, so the cells don't necessarily go away right away, but they don't come back that fast. And uh, sometimes patients have great outcomes with treatment, but they may still retain a small amount of the protein that we can measure, but it's not behaving very aggressively. So. So it's kind of a little bit of like the hibernating berry. Would rather it not be there, but um, it can be there quite for, for a long time. Now, the other big group of, of uh, myelomas is what we call, of course, the opposite, the non-hyperdeployed. And the um, uh, main characteristic of this subtype of myeloma is that they have something we call chromosome translocations. Now, a little bit of a just brief explanation of what that uh, means. Um, chromosome translocations are abnormal uh, fusions of different chromosomes. So let's just imagine this. Uh, you have a happy chromosome 14 here and you have a happy chromosome 11 here. And they normally are living separate lives and they do separate functions. It just so happens that chromosome 14 has to undergo certain cuts on a regular basis. And that's part of our normal immune response. Uh, we call it gene editing. And that's how uh, our immune system is able to generate all the different types of antibodies that it needs to protect our bodies. But every time you introduce a cut here, there's an opportunity for something to go wrong. And if you have another chromosome here that has a cut as well too, they can exchange little fragments, they can exchange partners, and that's what we call the translocations. And there's several of them, but there's three major subtypes. There is a translocation between chromosomes 11 and 14, the translocation 414, and the translocation 1416. And uh, you can go to the medical literature if you want to learn more about this, the specifics on the other ones, but those are the three major ones. Of this, two have deemed to be important because they identify myeloma situations where there may be what we call high-risk disease. And that is uh, patients with a T 414, so a translocation between chromosomes 4 and 14, or a T1416 have higher risk disease and uh, have to be approached slightly different. And I won't go into all those details in, in this video. Um, so it is critically important that patients get tested uh, for risk category at uh, the time of diagnosis and when they have their first bone marrow. And I'll, I'll talk uh, in the next section about the different techniques we have, but it's critically important that this information is available for the, for the treating doctors so that we can make plans based on, on what we know about the nature of the cells. The translocation 1114, um, it's uh, currently considered neutral. Yeah, in the old days when we only had um, older forms of chemotherapy, we thought it was better prognosis. Um, nowadays we consider it neutral uh, there may be some challenges in certain situations because um, uh, under some circumstances it may be more difficult to treat. On the other hand, there's some good news in that there are new drugs, specifically something called venetoclax, that is being developed for the treatment uh, of patients with a specific translocation. 
This is uh, something that already exists as an FDA approved medication. It comes in a pill form. It's used for patients with a similar uh, blood disorder, something called chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, but it's been explored as well for the treatment of myeloma. So those are the two big subgroups, the hyperdeployed myeloma and the non-hyperdeployed predominantly with the translocations. Now, for clinicians, we want to identify patients who have a higher risk. And by that, we mean that their cells have certain features that make us think about a more aggressive or more resistance, more resistant or more uh, quick to relapse version of myeloma. And to do so, we used uh, three markers, uh, two of the ones I mentioned. So I already mentioned the T414, the T1416, and the third one, which is um, a loss of DNA in the uh, small arm of chromosome 17. So you will see this referred in reports or in medical journals as a 17P deletion or P53 deletion. And again, I won't go into all the technical details regarding mutations or others, but um, if a clinician sees one of these three markers, and again, I'll repeat the T414, T1416, or minus 17, this might be indicating that the person has high-risk myeloma and how we approach it, how we counsel patients, and what type of treatments we use uh, will vary because of that information. Uh, the lesions of 17 are uh, primarily um, seen in about 10% of myeloma patients at the time of diagnosis, but they can increase as time goes by. So um, in one study, uh, we looked at this uh, at different time points in the patient's core, so that the more treatment the person has received, the more likely it is that they may have this, this 17 mutation. So uh, while the two major groups, again, the hyperdeployed and the non-hyperdeployed, specifically with the translocations, don't change over time, so if you're an 11, 14, you're 4, 14, you're going to be like that forever. There are some events like the 17P, and that's why I separated it, that may be acquired over time. And those, those, those are what we call progression events. Other progression events that are associated with high-risk disease include uh, 1Q amplification. And it's very important to, to, to make a couple of comments about this. Uh, 1Q amplification primarily is associated with high risk when it's seen with, with many copies of 1Q. Just one extra copy of 1Q is actually quite, quite common. About 40% of patients have this, and um, uh, it just doesn't have the power uh, for us to call this a high-risk genetic marker. We, we want you know, to define that better, so it's only when, when patients have many copies of 1Q that we think about high risk. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, we, we pre predominantly focus on the other three markers, the 414, 1416, and minus 17. And there's a number of other genetic markers, but I'll, I'll leave them out right now uh, for the sake of, of clarity. Now, the way, the way we test for this is mostly through a test that's called FISH, which stands for Fluorescent in Situ Hybridization. It's a test that we can only do with a fresh bone marrow. So if you have had a bone marrow and it wasn't done properly, it cannot be done um, um, out of the, that sample. It, it has to be done with a fresh sample. So, so it's important to have that discussion with, with the physicians. Uh, and we need fresh cells to send them out uh, to, the, to the laboratory. Um, if a fish is to be done, and this is a very important comment and, and one that we've, we've stressed over and over, when the bone marrow sample is sent to the laboratory, it needs to be sent with cells that are sorted and that is the you know the cells they send the liquid to the blood work to the to the to the laboratory and then they, they find ways in which we they can pull out only the myeloma cells just so that this fish test is only done on the myeloma cells themselves. Or um, another way of doing it is that they put the cells on a slide and then in the slide uh, they will add a second dye uh, that identifies those myeloma cells so that when they're reading the results in the in the lab they only um, do so for um, uh, for myeloma cells. They don't do this for the for the other cells because then you you run the risk of not knowing what you're scoring. Uh, the myeloma cells live in the bone marrow with many other cells. Um, it is not unusual for the sample that is sent for for a genetic analysis to be the last sample that is pulled out of the bone marrow, and it is uh, possible and actually quite common that that sample is diluted with just uh, regular blood 
So, you know, you can see a situation where the first sample that it sent for a pathology tells the, the, the physician, you know, there's 50% of this plasma cells, which, um, as, as all of you know, it's a, an abnormal count. Maybe the second sample is sent for some other testing, flow cytometry. And the third sample is sent for fish. And uh, it's not impossible that that third sample has only 1% plasma cells. So the, the ability of this genetic test to, to determine what are the subtypes of the disease, it's impossible once you have such a low percentage. Of, of the cells. So, so that's, that's again a, a critical uh, aspect of a good practice for genetic testing. Now there's other ways in which um, you know that we can uh, test for high risk. Uh, perhaps the most powerful way of doing this is through something called gene expression profiling. Um, and what they do with gene expression profiling, again they need a, a fresh bone marrow, they, they purify the cells uh, it's really, really interesting how this is done. We do this in our lab. It's done with some uh, metallic beads that are um, attached to certain antibodies that bind to the cell. So, so the antibody binds to the cell, but has a little metallic bead where on, on the edge, and then we turn on magnets, which pull the cells to the side and, and allows you to separate the, the myelom cells from the rest of the bone marrow. And that's what they do as well, too, for gene expression. With uh, gene expression, which there are several platforms, and there's commercial companies that are doing this routinely. Uh, you can actually tell the subtype of myeloma, so you can tell you know, which one of the translocations, you can see if it's hyperdiploid or not. But then they, they have the added advantage that they have other ways in which they can actually test for high risk because they test for uh, you know, thousands and thousands of genes at the same time. So they can create what we call profiles or signatures that can even better discern uh, high risk myeloma. When you use it by fish, we have about a quarter of patients who have high-risk myeloma gene expression. It's about 15% of patients, but it's, it's uh, enriched so that the, the actual high-risk component is, is of greater magnitude uh, to the patient. So, so again, one of the two must be done, um, and the clinical practice is must be done with either fish, uh, which uh, um, requires the um, uh, selection of cells or the use of the secondary marker, or the use of gene expression profiling, which is um, essentially um, uh, something that requires also the selection of cells. Um, a common question we get is other type of, of testing, something called cytogenetics. Um, cytogenetics is not done as much anymore. This was a test that was very, very useful many years ago. And it's a test that it's used for the uh, testing, for instance, uh, for genetics and leukemia. But the myeloma cells don't divide that fast. They actually don't have the, the uh, the ability to produce uh, uh, what we call metaphases, which are just essentially the structures that shows the DNA when it's all compacted. So, so the yield of doing this is very low, so we don't do this uh, really much more in the clinic. Um, there's other tools we're using now, and you're going to hear about them at medical meetings and from reports, uh, one of which is called Next Generation Sequencing, which is a very, very powerful way to look at uh, genetic markers. Well, this is not mainstream yet. Uh, what you can see there that you can't see with any of the other tests I mentioned is you can actually find mutations. And the, the hope and the, the idea is that as we learn about those mutations, people can add treatments that are very specific to the type of mutation so that that enhances the ability of the physician uh, to treat for the, for the specific myeloma. Uh, we do this uh, on, a, on a research basis, and our center and others um, offer this to patients. Uh, we don't fully have the intelligence to know yet exactly how we combine this, but, but uh, there's a lot of research effort uh, focused on this, and this is obviously one of the promising ways we have for the, for the future treatment of, of myeloma. Um, a very common question, you know, people hear about this, and of course we're 100% supportive of this, but we still need to learn how to make it uh, practical and, 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 and useful. So if we see a patient with new diagnosis, we may or may not do this mutation panel. We for sure will do the other genetic markers. But as we find someone who has been through some of the lines of treatment, we will you know, be somewhat emphatic about thinking of the idea of doing the mutation panel for looking for clinical trials or other, other specific pathways that might be helpful for patients. Um, I already mentioned before, um, not with gene sequencing, but for instance, with some of the markers, the 1114, there's some drugs that may work. Uh, 
turns out certain myelomas have other markers, such as could be, for instance, the um, uh, mutations of genes such as RAS or mutations of genes such as BRAF, and people are developing drugs and working along those lines. And it's quite possible it will be a mixture of drugs that target those mutations, perhaps plus some standard of care, until we get really, really smart about how to use this, this information. And um, last but not least, I want to talk about something else you're going to hear about genetics, which is called the minimal residual disease. Um, this is a, a different topic. This is a, um, a genetic test we use to measure very deeply how many myeloma cells may uh, exist in a bone marrow of someone who has already received treatment. Um, it looks for a DNA fingerprint, if you may, of, of the myeloma cells, and it can go very, very deep. It can go as deep as finding out one cell in a million cells, perhaps if you have the right sample, one cell in 10 million cells, because it just depends how many of them you test. Um, but I bring it here not to expand on its use or the controversies behind it, but just to say it's a different thing. It's sort of a screening tool and one that looks for that signature to see if there's any myeloma cells that remain in, in the bone marrow. So it's different from, from the way we're thinking about genetics. To finalize, I just want to say that while genetics are very, very important and we're using them to develop models and prognosticate patients, they're not 100% the answer. They can only account for certain variability. Uh, so obviously, if one has um, standard risk disease, we're, we, we prefer to see that, but we still take the disease very seriously and we'll, you know, we'll discuss with you as we go along what may be some of the options for treatment. Um, uh, the inverse is that I've seen patients with high risk markers who are doing very, very well and we, with uh, whom we have been able to work to control the disease including patients with some of the, the, the worst markers like the 17P who have received optimal therapy and, and have done well. Um, it, it is true that if you take a group of patients who have good markers and a group of patients that have more aggressive markers, you'd much rather be here on the one that has the good markers. Um, but, you know, those are the cards that are dealt to the patient. And, and uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what happens to the group. It's always the individual. It's always the end of one. So, so we would work with you. And know that the myeloma community is very, very focused on finding solutions for patients with high-risk genetic markers. So there's a number of trials, a number of drugs that are being, being tested in this regard. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I tried to make it very simple and in um, understandable terms. And um, uh, thank you for your attention.